across the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco Welcome to the Waco History Podcast. I'm Randy Lane, great-grandson of Waco architect Roy E. Lane. Over 100 years ago, he designed the Alico Building, Hippodrome, and other well-known landmarks. My co-host, Dr. Stephen Sloan of Baylor's Institute for Oral History, is helping me learn Waco's known and unknown stories. In this episode, Waco in the Wild Wired West, the end of the Chisholm Trail. Stephen tells us about the technological breakthrough that forever changed the West. It's light as air, stronger than whiskey, and cheap as dirt. And now, join us on a trip into Waco's past. Cross the Brazos and Waco, ride hard and I'll make it by dawn. Cross the Brazos and Waco, I'm safe when I reach San Antonio. All right, Stephen, so when we first started this podcast, we were kicking around ideas, and you said one that initially to me kind of sounded boring, but you were very passionate about it. So what was that? I'm still, I'm still excited about it. It's barbed wire, <laughs> or as my grandfather used to say, Bob wire. <laughs> and so this is something you've done presentations on and stuff. Before, I, I right? have, and uh, I was really interested in writing my dissertation on it, and an advisor said, don't do that. So when did you first come up with this idea oh, then? Uh, so this has been gestating for, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years. It's, it's, it's been in my head for a long time. It sounds like it's long enough that I think we finally put it out there for people to know about. So so tell me, what is so interesting about Bob Well, Wire? what you'll find in this talk that I give is it strings together a series of compelling points. Okay. So it was barbed wire, series of compelling points. You get it? That's what barbed wire is. I, I'm, uh, sorry. I'm a little yeah, slow. Sorry. See, I wish I could yeah. see you. I might be a this little bit quicker This is a COVID the edition, like, okay. so you're a little blunted uh, and how, sh- how sharp yes. you are. When I've given this talk before, one of the first things I do is I, I have people pull out their cell phones because we want to start thinking about technology and how quickly technology goes out of date. And usually there'll be somebody in the crowd that pulls out a, you know, a five-year-old cell phone and we can make fun of them. A little flip yeah, phone, little flip phone and, and, and say, oh, how, how old that is. But you got to think barbed wire <laughs> technology kind of peaked in the 1880s and it's still out there serving the same function and the same purpose that it was in the 1880s. There's been no major advancements in barbed wire in almost 150 years. And it seems kind of an obvious tech solution to a problem of open space, but it takes a long time to come to as far as uh, Hmm. something to get settled on. Sounds like the only thing I can think of that's more technically advanced and serves the same purpose is an electrified fence. That's right. Yeah. So, but it, but again, you're not redesigning it. You're just, you're just hooking no. up electricity. Barbed wire, the story of barbed wire goes back to really for the United States for the longest time, the law was the open range, particularly in the West that, and of course you'll still go to places out, out West of here and you'll run into some areas that are open range where you'll see cattle, sheep kind of roaming freely across the land, unimpeded access to grass and water. This was the rule for a lot of federally owned land. So cattlemen and sheepmen could bring their cows onto federally owned land and graze there. But eventually what's going to happen as more and more settlement takes place, they want more private property is the thing that we hold more valuable than the open range. And so Mm -hmm. this interest in how do we create some sort of sensible fencing to create contained spaces rather than open spaces. And it sounds like it's probably economical as well, because if you were to build a nice white picket fence, it'd probably be really expensive compared You're to You're getting ahead of the story here, Randy. Oh, yeah. sorry. So so yeah, they're they're experimenting. So if you if you didn't have barbed wire, what would you use for fencing? What what would the options be? I guess wood. Um, I'm sure maybe back in the day something like a chain link fence probably wasn't around. I can't really think of much else. On the prairie, they experiment with all sorts of things. They do ridges. They do ditches. You can think of the old moat Uh, option. (laughs) They'll use sod bricks to kind of build a fence that way. They might use brush. Sometimes they dug trenches around crops. You can see a lot of these solutions are real labor intensive. There's not a lot of wood out on the prairie. You can think if some places west of where you grew up, there's not a lot of wood 
out there to build yep. extensive fencing. Sometimes they would experiment with hedges. And this is what they're doing in the mid 19th century is farmers are planting hedges as the solution. Sounds pretty labor intensive to me. Very labor intensive, but what you what you have in the in the 19th century are these hedge seed salesmen that are going around the west and they're hawking their seed as as growing the ultimate hedgerow. So mm. they're looking for thorny hedgerows that would keep animals secure. Osage orange hedges were preferred out on the Great Plains and if some mm. of our older listeners may be familiar with horse apples. What's a horse it's a, apple? It's a big looking fruit, but it's not edible, but it grows on these Osage orange hedges. And so mm. they're growing different sorts of hedges on the Gulf Coast. They're growing uh, Cherokee rose hedges and, and different things like that to try to create some sort of fencing solution. There's a lot of problems with it, though. Sounds like it takes forever to grow. It takes a long time to grow. You can't move it, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to readjust your grazing pattern, you can't move it. It's slow. It's really slow. Rats love living in there. And also it's creating shade and it's taking water to grow it. So all sorts of problems with it. So you're you're beginning to just get a taste of this technological solution that they needed in the mid-19th century. So they start mm -hmm. experimenting with smooth wire. This is the first thing that they're doing when wire manufacturing comes about. They start experimenting with smooth wire uh, in the early 1800s. In the West, you can buy smooth wire by the 1840s. It's not galvanized, so they're painting it early on, but it's kind of cheap and it's, it's becoming more durable. It's improving in the 1850s and 1860s. And so by the time you get to 1870, there's a lot of smooth wire in the West. So galvanized is like, it keeps it from yeah. rusting? Is yeah, that the idea? Yeah, keep it from rusting. So they're having to paint it early on, but eventually mm. they start using more and more galvanized. Now, the problem that you run into with smooth wire is a lot of cattle breeds in the West are much more aggressive than cattle mm. breeds in the East. Principally, the Texas Longhorn can trample and uproot a smooth wire fence easily. Doesn't hurt. And it's also a, a lot more brittle. The, the way it's manufactured, just a single smooth wire is fairly brittle. So the West, where it gets really cold and it gets really hot, you know, it'll, it'll get brittle and break in the winter. It'll heat up and droop in the summertime. And so this is a big issue where they're, they're trying to, to figure out how to deal with this particular problem in the West. It's still pretty expensive. By 1870, it still cost a lot of money to repair these fences in the West. And so we, we, we have figures that it's one of the biggest expenses with trying to secure some sort of homestead in the West is what do you do about fencing? Are you fascinated yet? I am. I was actually thinking about how it would droop in the summer because metal has that property. And I was thinking of my experience playing musical instruments, especially the trumpet. The tuning would change based on the time of year you're playing. The metal is cold or hot. And so I was thinking maybe that's the advancement people can make in barbed wire is something that doesn't change during different temperatures. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Well, well, well that's, that's one of the things the barbing process is going to solve for us. Oh. If you're a aspiring inventor in the mid 19th century, you're working on some sort of solution for the ultimate wire. In the first 75 years of the 19th century, there are 1,200 patents for fencing, all different kinds of fencing. And two thirds wow. of those are going to come after 1865. So there's a 10 year period here after the Civil War where they're really trying to solve this issue. And so they're issuing a lot of patents and they're looking for a solution. Now, the first patent for wire fencing was actually a guy in New Braunfels. He, he patented a, a, a round wire fence, but not very good for, for livestock. The first use of a barbed fencing occurred actually in Austin, who started placing pieces of metal on top of a board fence. So he took a board fence, put pieces of metal on it, and his neighbors complained. Uh, <laughs> That he, they thought it was cruel that he was doing this. Sometimes he was using metal pieces. He was using perhaps some glass shards on it. In fact, uh, John Greninger is the guy's name. He's murdered in 1862. Because of that? We don't know. We don't know if it was his mm. fence or not, but he his fence he put up in 1857. So it wasn't too long after he put this fence up that his neighbors didn't like that he was murdered. And so that's a cold case mm. somebody can research and solve. I was wondering... 
about the whole idea of people not liking the barbs hurting the animals if that ever came up as something that was talked about and i'm sure that was it was and there's a lot of anti-fence advocates uh, they're gonna show some horrific i've seen some illustrations they've done of like a horse cut open and things like that that mm. when they start using barbed fencing that's a lot of the criticisms it's it's too cruel to do something like mm. this so you start to see there's french patents on barbed wire there's american patents the first all metal barbed wire patent is in 1866 uh, following the civil war and there's several different important patents in the 1860s. Some of them have revolving wheels on them and, 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 and all sorts of different uh, ways in which they're experimenting with wire. The part of the country that becomes known for barbed wire inventors was DeKalb, Illinois. It becomes known as Barb City. <laughs> And you have all these inventors that are in that area producing wire. One of the principal ones that's most important was a farmer named Joseph Glidden. And uh, Joseph Glidden becomes a really important inventor because ultimately it's his patent that's going to be secured and recognized as the patent for barbed wire. Is this the same type of barbed wire that's still used today? or is It, it was is. His yeah, the different. Glidden winner, as it becomes known, is similar to what you would think of when you think of barbed wire. And actually, okay. Mrs. Glidden, we have her to thank because animals kept getting into her garden. And so she kept pressing mm -hmm. Joseph to do something about it. He actually modified an old coffee mill that you could twist. And he would twist wire together that way and kind of slide a barb in from time to time. And so that twist was the key. The thing that would hold the barb in place is that twist that was put in the wire. Yeah, because it looks kind of like you twisted some wire around uh, another wire and then left the ends sticking out, right? That's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. So you got those little those little barbs in there, and they're locked in. They're not they're not moving. So uh, it solves a lot of those problems that we talked about. It's not labor intensive. Doesn't take up much space. No shade. No pest. And it's cheap. It's mm -hmm. about the same as making smooth wire. Because of that twist, because of those two wires together, it's heat resistant, it's cold resistant. Ah. So he's not the first inventor, but his becomes the most popular. And so there's other competing patent. There, there's a big fight in the 1870s over who has the real claim to be the father of barbed wire. In fact, one of them is a one of those Osage orange seed salesmen. He's got his own patent. So there's several folks that are interested in this. So it's like the buggy whip guy going after the car manufacturer. Exactly. You know, who did it first? <laughs> who did it first? The way Texas comes into this conversation is the Texas market for wire was really big in the 1870s. And so the Glidden Company, or as it becomes called the Barb Fence Company, decides to send salesmen down to Texas. So if we can secure sales, that'll help our argument and help our company. So in 1875, they send two salesmen down to Texas. But they go to Houston, which is not the place to go if you want to sell barbed wire in the 1870s. Why'd they do that? Just a, a fundamental misunderstanding of where the cattle market was in Texas. Initial sales are disappointing. Farmers are skeptical. That first Texas trip was a big disappointment. Uh, and this is where another figure enters the story. John Gates, or Bet a Million Gates, as he was known. <laughs> it's a good name if you're going to be a fence It salesman. is. And he, he is one of these characters, <laughs> big promoter, big salesman. He convinces the uh, Barb Fence Company to give him a shot at the Texas market. Nice. And so this is what he does. And it's a great story what he does to try to pitch this idea. And so future entrepreneurs out there, pay attention to this. So His elevator pitch before elevators. Exactly. It, he had a slogan. <laughs> it's light as air, stronger than whiskey, and cheap as dirt. <laughs> and so he goes to San Antonio and... He was working Military Plaza in San Antonio by day. So he's talking to vendors and shoppers at Military Plaza. And then at night, he would go to the casinos and work the cattlemen in the casinos. And what he does, what he decides to do as a publicity stunt and as a promotion is to make some bets. He begins building something in the middle, middle of Military Plaza. And so something's being built out there. And so onlookers are kind of gathering to see what this is. I and mean, it becomes apparent soon that he's building a corral in the middle of Military Plaza. Hmm. And then he issues a challenge to these cattlemen buddies that he's cultivated. You bring in your worst longhorns. You bring in your most belligerent longhorns, and we'll take bets as to whether my fence 
can hold up to your Longhorns. Hmm. And so, you know, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of betting action on this as the crowd kind of gathers or bets are being passed amongst the crowd. And with a really dramatic display, Gates releases the herd into the corral. And so, you know, so you got a huge crowd. How many are these? Uh, I don't know how many were in the uh, initial herd. Quite yeah, a quite a few uh, cows in this herd. Of terrible That's longhorns. That's right. Belligerent. I think the word was used as belligerent uh, longhorns. That's okay. the word of the day. And so there's, there's with uh, much pomp and circumstance, they're released. They thunder in. They immediately head toward the fence, hit the fence, and the reports say they made contact. They drew back. They're angry. They charge the fence again. They draw, they draw back. This happens a few times. You, this is the first time a, a Longhorn's ever seen a, a barbed fence. And the fence holds. So this is the ultimate test, right? The toughest breed Success. toughest breed in the West yeah. uh, loses to the barbed wire fence. And soon Gates is inundated with orders. And mm-hmm. so this, this barb, barbed fence company is up and running in Texas. They should have called that the Texas running of the bulls. That would have been great. And, and I think now, you know, we're watching UFC fights. Uh, we're watching Korean baseball. I mean, in the in the cor- coronavirus crisis, this would be good programming. <laughs> we saw sales dramatically jump. Uh, sales go from about ten thousand pounds in 1875 to 2.84 million pounds the next year. Uh, even smooth wire manufacturers, they're selling a lot more. So they're increasingly selling. I mean, the sales of barbed wire by 1880 are at 80 million pounds. Wow. And so they're they're selling a lot of barb- barbed wire to fence in uh, the West. Was San Antonio the best place for that at the time? Or, you know, when I think about cattle, I think of like Fort Worth or something like that. Was that a place to go as well? Or was San Antonio just as good? San Antonio was a good place to start. And so right. and it kind of moves and grows out from there. Uh, okay. Because you got to think of these ranches down in South Texas. The, these these are the cattlemen that he's tapping into in that market in San Antonio. So not not everybody's happy about this boom in barbed wire. And this is where this intersects a little bit with Waco history. You've been waiting for me to get to the Waco history part. <laughs> so this is a another name for barbed wire is the devil's rope. So, so those mm. would be the critics of barbed wire would call it uh, the devil's rope. And actually uh, out in West Texas, you can visit the devil's rope museum and see uh, a wide variety. There are folks that collect barbed wire uh, samples. Uh, people have barbed wire collections. The Mayburn Museum uh, here in town has actually a pretty impressive barbed wire collection. It's a great band name, too. Uh, uh, the Devil's Rope. Devil's yeah. Rope. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, youth pastor wouldn't have let me listen to uh, that band. <laughs> you know, this is where a affordable solution starts to run into advocates of the open range, right? Because there are those that are still mm-hmm. like this idea of an open range. And the period of... The 1870s is also this period of the Chisholm Trail and other trails. And Chisholm Trail, which part of it came up through Waco. And so just to kind of bring our listeners up to speed, Chisholm Trail is the location of this great cattle drive. All You can go down now and see these oversized statues of Texas Longhorns with vaqueros and cowboys out by the suspension bridge. That's to commemorate this large number of cattle, hundreds of thousands of cattle that would have come up along trails like the Chisholm Trail. Coming from South Texas, taking them to trailheads so they can go to market back east. Mm -hmm. The uh, trails existed to get the beef on the hoof back to the mouths that need to be fed. And the reason why things like the Chisholm Trail exist is during the Civil War, all these herds down in South Texas are going untended. So you have cattle multiplying and you also have unbranded cattle multiplying down in South Texas. So they're not claimed by anyone. And so entrepreneurs then are going down and rounding up these cattle and driving them north where as a steer that was worth about $4 before the war, after the war, it's worth about $40. Wow. And so it's free money down there if they can get it to market. Generally, they're driving them north. They're going to feed them for a season on that open range, get fat off open grass, and then ship them back on the hoof to be slaughtered. We don't have refrigerated rail cars yet, so we're shipping them back on the hoof to be slaughtered at Chicago and places like that. And so this is like the heyday of the cowboy, like what we think of as the cowboy. That's right. And so right now we're in the 150th 
uh, anniversary period of the Chisholm Trail. It's kind of running, uh, starts in the late 1860s, going to run through the 1870s. So there's a lot of money to be made. But what happens in the 1870s is as settlement increases and people are fencing in this new property that they're expanding into in the 1870s, cattlemen that are driving their herds north increasingly are running into wire that blocks the cattle trails. So there's range war in the 1870s and the 1880s in Texas, uh, where a lot of these cattlemen just start cutting wire in driving the cattle across across other people's property uh, to get them to market. That's probably one downfall of the barbed wire is it's it's easy to probably get rid of if you don't want it there. You could just get those snips with you there and you can get rid of that fence pretty That's quickly. Right. That's right. This is all throughout the 1870s. We're going to see the peak of this in the early 70s and those numbers are going to decrease in the 1870s. Some of it is farmers that are using wire, but increasingly cattlemen are going to see some of the benefits uh, of using wire. But this becomes the biggest problem during the seasonal trail drives where they run into new wire that may not have been there last season. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, bill banning barbed wire that's introduced in the Texas legislature in 1871. It doesn't pass, but there was some discussion over this in Texas. So who's that sponsored by? The people who want the cattle or the people who don't want the cattle to be mistreated? Uh, for that, that's that's the cattlemen that are sponsoring that. They're trying to get rid uh, of this wire of uh, that's kind of impeding on their, their access to markets. Uh, even Illinois that I talked about earlier, that's where Barb City is, uh, the legislature doesn't recognize it legally until 1887. So it's new tech and people aren't sure about this new tech. Increasingly, in the 1870s and 1880s, we have more and more farms being created as folks are pouring out into the West. And people are even putting up illegal fences. You know, people are claiming land by putting up a fence, mm -hmm. uh, hoping that that secures their claim. There are deaths over this. I mean, people are working at night, wearing bandanas, cutting through wire. So you can see all sorts of uh, fence cutting that's in full force in the late 1870s, early 1880s. Uh, there's even a uh, fence cutting war that, that climaxes in Texas in 1883. Uh, more than half of all counties in Texas report fence cutting. Hmm. It becomes seen as property damage eventually, and it starts hmm. to uh, affect land prices. Eventually, a special legislative session, you know how hard it is to get the Texas legislature together. They call <laughs> a special legislative session just on the issue of fence cutting. This is a John Ireland in 1883 calls a special session, and he's trying to find a way to end this violence uh, in the fence cutting war. And so eventually things have changed, and there's a law passed in 1884 that says it's a felony to cut a fence. Before then was it a misdemeanor? Uh, it was just a misdemeanor, yeah. And so you can see how sentiment had changed since 1879, where they're trying to make fencing illegal. Now they're protecting fencing by the time you get to the mid-1880s. So really, by the mid 1880s, there's not the fence cutting wars have died down. So what's fun to go back and look at is just all these different designs of kind of the ways in which they tried to solve this problem of fencing early on. There's thousands and thousands of different iterations of what they saw the fence could look like. What are some of your favorites? Oh, there's some that have sawtooth ribbon wire in it. There's the, the twists are always creative. I, some of them have uh, barbs on them. Like it, they look a little bit like a spur. You can tell they kind of take that concept of the spur on a boot and they've tried to make some sort of wire out of it. By the time you get to the late 1870s, people that are making illegal wire jump into the market. Now, what's illegal well, wire? Well, they're, they're uh, infringing on someone else's patent. Ah. Uh, in fact, John Bedamillion Gates wasn't getting enough profit from the wire he was selling, and he starts making illegal wire. So he's got contacts, so he's making illegal wire and selling it in the 1870s and 1880s. What about something that like, when cattle hit the fence, it makes a sound? that disrupts them, like it, it rattles something, innovative ways. I have, see, you were born after your time, Randy. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> seen any solutions that offer that sort of thing, but that might work with dogs. Yeah, like a big whistle or something that uh, was high-pitched, only cattle could hear. That's right. If that's how that's they right. work. <laughs> we see the number effective on, on places like the Chisholm Trail. In 1871, 
700,000 Longhorns were driven to Kansas. This is not on the Chisholm Trail, but other trails as well. By 1880, that's 267,000. So we see the numbers drop all throughout the 1870s. We see these big expressions of using barbed wire, like the XIT Ranch, uh, which is 10 different counties, part of 10 different counties in Texas, the XIT Ranch uh, up in the Panhandle. Uh, you see these experimental ranches that are using barbed wire fencing to really do these large operations. And so they're doing things that couldn't have been conceivable without some sort of fencing. Uh, XIT is going to fence in 3 million acres. And so what really brings this thing full circle is when the cattlemen themselves start embracing barbed mm. wire as a solution to a problem they didn't know they had. It gets cheaper. So when it's first introduced, it's about 20 cents a pound. And about 20 years later, it's two cents a pound. That's pretty good. Production costs drop. And so this is why the West, when you go in the West, it's all fenced in. I mean, it gets so cheap, <laughs> it, it drops to a price point that uh, we, we can fence in a lot of nothing uh, out in West Texas and places beyond. Is this also after maybe a lot of those wild cattle that were being picked up and brought to market? They've kind of been claimed now and people are staking out their particular territory and just keeping the cattle there and then i was also thinking having somebody like a cowboy who keeps track of all your cattle on the open range could be expensive labor intensive but if you could just fence them in then you know where they are that's true it gives the ranchers a lot more control you're from you're from oklahoma this is also a period where oklahoma which was going to be permanent indian territory is broken up and sold to settlers so all those homesteaders that are coming into oklahoma are breaking and of course also, the rail network's developing, right? So, you know, we're getting mm. trains in places that we didn't have trains before. So we don't have to go to Abilene, Kansas to put our, uh, our, our cow on a train. Uh, we can do it in places much closer than that. Probably also important for not having cattle run across the train tracks if you can fence them in, right? That's right. You know, there are challenges that are faced early on. One of the ones that they talked about in the late 19th century was some of these real harsh winters that they had. You can think what cattle on an open range would do in a particularly hard winter. They would kind of drift until they found some sort of shelter, you know, a, a gully or a low point, and then they would find shelter. Well, with fencing, they drift to the fence. And so what you had all along these fence rows after the 85, 86 blizzards in that winter alone, you had dead cattle piled up against the fence line. And, and there, there are these stories of, for miles and miles, animals being piled up that you could walk for miles without your foot ever hitting the ground, just walking from carcass to carcass. Well, that sounds Sorry, terrible. Sorry, that's kind of dark. I want a hamburger now for some reason, though. <laughs> All these things lead them to kind of shift and change their design, continue to work on the product. But yeah, by the time we get to the 1880s, the, the barbed wire is what it is, and it's kind of remained... Uh, the same since then. So when does the actual Chisholm Trail like completely shut down? Uh, really, by the time you get to the early 1880s, it's it's gone. All those factors that we talked about earlier kind of contribute to the demise of it. If we had some visual here, I would show you a map where you can see how many farms are being created in that period because farmers are moving into the West and settling a lot of that land. You know, all this expansion that doesn't take place in the Civil War, a lot of it's going to be released in the late 1860s, 1870s. Maybe we can get some of those maps for the show notes oh, yeah. and some of those uh, prototype barbed wire concepts that people were coming I, up with. I can with definitely too, do that. I'll definitely get you a picture of the Glidden winter so you can see uh, what it looked like. So I'm hoping we have a uh, barbed wire sesquicentennial in 2024. Are you going to spearhead I, that? Are you on the committee? I think that that could be uh, that would be a party. You know, it, <laughs> you know, barbed wire. We can think about how it started, but of course, has all sorts of applications in the 20th century. Unfortunately, in war and and other sort of applications that it's going to become uh, known for in the 20th century. Prisons. Prisons. Yeah. Uh, World War One. Razor wire. All these. All these sorts of things. So anyway, I find it fascinating. I will tell you, it's it's much more interesting now that I've heard the whole story. It makes sense now. I see why you're into it. You know, because think <laughs> about how else would you do the West? I mean, one of the most popular fences up to this point 
was a Virginia fence, which you've seen before, which is where you kind of stack wood caddy corner at the corner. It's kind of a zigzag fence. It's made out of wood, really labor intensive to construct. It's taking a lot of wood. I mean, on the Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas, uh, they're building their homes out of sod because they don't mm -hmm. have they don't have wood supplies uh, to build their home out of. It really took some sort of new technology to, uh, in order to make it happen. What do you think the West would look like today if barbed wire didn't exist? That's a great question. You're talking about an <laughs> alternate history. I, I will recommend, let me think about that while I recommend something. There's a movie <laughs> called Man Without a Star, which is a Kirk Douglas movie, an old Western. And it's a great... If you want a barbed wire themed Western, everything from Kirk Douglas is scarred emotionally and scarred physically by barbed wire. He's got barbed wire scars all over his body, but eventually at the end, he goes to Canada where it's not fenced in anymore. Mm. Just this idea of what's going to happen to the West now that it's a fenced in place. Mm. How can we be courageous and bold? And it's kind of a death of the cowboy and barbed wire help contribute to it. Uh, sort of saga. Yeah, I also think about the idea of like the American spirit of adventuring and pioneering. And if everything's already claimed and sectioned off, it doesn't feel quite the same. That's right. I mean, it, it is the antithesis of freedom. So, but, you know, is the West about freedom or is it about business? That's a good point. We spend whole semesters talking about this sort of thing. So how would the West look without barbed wire? Well, you know, I don't know if you've ever accidentally hit a deer. Yeah, that's the unintended consequence there. There would have been carnage. There'd be all sorts of carnage if cattle were roaming free. I don't know if you've ever been out West, and there's still places, of course, that are open range, and, and you've come around the corner and you've met cattle standing in the roadway, but it, it, it would not have been an uncommon sight then, but it, it really kind of throws you now if it happens. I think of also the idea that you couldn't really reinforce your borders, you know, if you had claimed a certain type of land and your neighbor did too, like if there weren't fencing that was good enough to actually put up and no one put up a fence, it'd be harder to have claims for territories for generations and stuff. That's right. So Canada was not fenced off at that time. And is it more fenced off now, I guess? Yeah, it'll eventually reach there as well. We can think of kind of Texas moving out as far as the frontier of where this fencing is really going to kick in, where the market is early on and kind of expanding up through the West. And I guess you, you still need cowboys. I mean, they're, they're basically tending to the cattle on the land that's fenced off instead of driving them from place to place per se. But it's interesting how much that affects the culture too. I mean, people here wear cowboy boots and they never get near a horse or a cow. So Yeah. You know, the, the, the government finally comes around and realizes they can tax cattle if they can keep them in one place. The counties realize that. The state realizes that. And so there's all sorts of reasons. I mean, cattlemen at some point are, are driving cattle uh, livestock back and forth to keep out of one jurisdiction. <laughs> so, you know, municipalities begin to realize that there's a benefit of keeping cattle in one place. Very and really, the United States has always kind of thought of itself, we're about settlement. That's always been the American dream, right? You have your own plot of land and then you have your own plot of land to work. And so mm -hmm. you can see how momentum's behind the settlers more than the cattlemen. Totally makes sense. Uh, but the real winners here were the barbed wire companies. But it sounds also like similar to oil, like the cost of it went way down. And so you still have to produce a bunch of it to make your profit. Yeah, I don't know that there's a lot of money in it now. You had to get on the ground level, as they say. We'll have to do another episode that talks about the Chisholm Trail and kind of life on the trail and things like that. We can do another episode on that. But this, this kind of gives you a sense of kind of a larger story that that local story was operating within. We can call this Barbed Wire, What Killed the Chisholm Trail. The title of my lecture when I gave it was The Wired, Wired West. <laughs> I spent uh, a lot of time thinking about I, that. I like that yeah. better. <laughs> All right, Stephen, thanks for, for sharing your, your insight on this subject. And I'm glad that I finally heard the story of Barbed Wire. So now you can understand how it has compelling points. Yes. Okay, good. Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. We'll see you next time. time ago. As he dropped the guns that she hated 
when the money brass us below Cross the brass and wake home Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the brass and wake home I'll walk straight in old San Antonio Then the night came alive with gunfire He knew that at last it'd been found As the ranger's badge showed brightly El bandito lay on the ground Carmela knew he was dying That all of her dreams were in vain As she kissed his lips for the last time She heard him whisper again Cross the Brazos and Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos and Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio I'm safe when I reach San Antonio 